Well, welcome all to the AAE today. Um, it's our new chapter office, and we are here celebrating um, kind of the legacy of architecture in the East Bay. Um, and by doing this lecture series that we have established. Uh, my name is Brian Streisick. I am an architect with Penley Architecture and Planning, but I was also the 2022 AIA East Bay Board President. And I had a few um, goals for that year, uh, last year. Uh, one being to uh, get us a new office space. So super happy that the board and Mike and everyone came together and found this place in Berkeley, next to UC Berkeley. Well, public transportation is a wonderful space, and we are starting to finally use it for uh, for good. Uh, second was to really outreach to members more. Um, we we made an effort to go to all four counties that the AA East Bay chapter is part of. So we went to Napa, had home tours. We went to um, Solano County. We went out to Alameda County, which we're here, and then out to Contra Costa County. So we were able to get to all four counties and then also do specific events about Hercules, about Pleasanton. So a very diverse um, program last year and really got a lot of great feedback about the AA East Bay from having those meetings in other places. Um, and the third thing I wanted to do is have a lecture series, really promote this space, um, promote that we're here in Berkeley, and then honor the people who have really helped shape the East Bay. So uh, we've developed this nine part lecture series based on project types and have really concentrated on architects, urban planners, landscape architects, uh, educators who have really um, shaped us and really have been integral to developing the East Bay. Um, so tonight we have our second program of our nine part series on the history of the Bay Area. Uh, the first one, if you guys missed it, was on renovation. I think this is a good segue, people saving and transforming buildings and moving into talking about the history of them and moving into new buildings as we go further on the series. Uh, so tonight we're joined by John King. Last time I introduced John King, he said to keep it short, I'm going to try. Um, but he's the urban, uh, he works for the, the uh, Chronicle in St. Day 2, writing about urban design in the Bay Area. He's written a uh, few books. He was finalist, two time finalist of both the Bright Fight List, um, East Bay Residence. Um, I walked here. He walked here. <laughs> <laughs> I walked here. <laughs> um, so that, I guess that's short enough. Uh, next person is Mitchell Schwartzer, who was a, I just found this out, was a professor at CCA, now retired. Emeritus. Emeritus. Oh, perfect. Emeritus is the best. Um, he is uh, several books, and really, like, we had him last year about Helltown, talked about Oakland and how it developed, which was great. And also wrote this great book about San Francisco architecture, or San Francisco Bay Area history. Um, we're hoping that when he updates it next time, that we get a little bit more East Bay in here. It's a really small chapter compared to San Francisco, but uh, something to consider. Um, and then lastly, we're going to be led by Luigi Siriano, who is does it all in architecture. It's hard to categorize you. You're an author, an architect, a theoretician, a collaborator, all these things. So whatever time you want to put on them, feel free. Uh, wonderful person, really concentrated in modernism, really passionate about that. Also written several books, um, and lots of them are here, right? Um, or Hell Modern, you should get it. This thing is absolutely gorgeous. Um, totally, yeah, you can't do to zoom in on it. And then, uh, wonderful book, so please, uh, please check those out. Uh, they've been um, in my library, and uh, so I'm glad that you all are here to kind of share your thoughts. I'm looking forward to seeing where the conversation goes, and I'm going to hand over to Pierre Luigi. Yes, thank you so much uh, uh, for this conversation. I think that the red wine kicked in, so I feel very relaxed. Uh, <laughs> and I am uh, delighted to connect with uh, uh, John and Mitchell, who I've known for a long time, and but I've never had this role of actually asking questions. I never ask questions, or, or it's more of an informal kind of setting. But I think it's great that uh, we can uh, converse uh, in, in a more uh, friendly setting about issues that matter to all of us. So uh, as a premise, I, I do what I do from the perspective of the practicing architect. So I see history as a living thing. And uh, I have noticed that uh, coming from 
on our side of the world that uh, architecture works very much like law. It's all about precedence, right? Uh, what has happened before? And uh, what we pick and choose as what has happened before determine the possibilities of what will happen next. And so this Bay uh, area architecture, Bay history, it, it's highly charged uh, for reasons that both of you know very well if you've written extensively about it. And uh, if, for those of you that have seen Club Angry Man, if you remember, Aaron Carter said, I'm not so sure. Yeah. And so I am saying all my life has been, I'm not so sure that things are exactly as being represented, reproduced. And it's not that, it's not that, but there's a little more. So let's, let's talk about this a little more. And you are uh, very sophisticated thinkers on that. And so I'm delighted we're having this conversation. So I would ask a, a very, but now question, but uh, very factual. Uh, the Western Haven house is a very well-known house by Howard Hamilton Harris. Is that house a, a, a house that belongs to Bay Area architecture history? Or is it a house that belongs to California modernism? Or is it a house that belongs to Southern California? Or is it a house that belongs to just Howard Hamilton Harris? Um, this is a house that's just above the UC Berkeley campus, and it was, I hope UC is taking good care of it, because it's, it, was, it, was dated to, months ago. it was dated to the CED 15 years or so ago, I have no idea the exact time. Um, gestures like that are wonderful, except then you're kind of relying on the, the mercy of cash strapped parts of the UC system that are not bio labs and things like that. Um, I mean, I would not put it as a Southern California house. It, it's a great little house. It totally understands the power of space and the power of the places to be. And, you know, it's, it's also part of just kind of the basic modernism of the mid-century and everything, but it's totally attuned to the place you're in, which is in the Bay Area on a hillside with this incredible the layering, you know, the Bay Area's distinct feature is the layering of water and topography and just how that enfolds the region and, you know, the Bay, defi the Bay defines the Bay Area. And that little house grounds it so well. So, I mean, I would say it's, I would say it's Bay Area style, even though it's not, but it's, infused with the fact it was built in the Bay Area for the Bay Area. So that side did matter for that particular Yes, sense. to me. Me too. You have four categories? <laughs> no. <laughs> did I? Well, I mean, I guess I did. <laughs> but I mean, I'm just, no, okay. no. it was, a, I mean, I, I could have said, is the, is the, the Salt Institute a California building? Is it a, a Southern California building? Is it a, a current building in California? And it, you can extend that. I mean, it's just a, a way of organizing this heritage that we have and where do things fit in this, this framework. I agree with John. I think, I mean, I think it's clearly a Bay Area, you know, Bay Area house is a Paris house. Forget your other category. <laughs> but is, is it a- No, I think it's hard you know, I mean, you know, I, you know, the mid-century was probably an era, if we talk about like a globalization of architecture, which certainly is the case from the 90s onward in the Bay Area and, and around the world, right? And it's hard even now to talk about, right? You know, the divorce, the art, architects are designing across the planet, right? And in the, in the mid-century, less so, but certainly they were designing across California. So you have the same architects working both in the Los Angeles area as, as well as the Bay Area, sometimes even in the Central Valley, Tahoe. So I, it, I think it's hard to kind of, I don't know if there's a fundamental, you know, difference. Uh, certainly, the cladding styles are more redwood up here, and cedar, uh, because they don't have those trees down there, you know. Uh, but they have a lot of the things that, you know, what, what John talked about, you know, certainly the, the, the ocean and the sky and the, 
a really precipitous topography, they have it just like we do. So a lot of things in common, I would say the cladding materials are probably one of the distinguishing features. You know, you have a little bit different, right? A little bit. Well, right. Thank you. Second question, when did Bay Area modern architecture star, in your opinion, at which point within the 20th century, or if you believe it started in the 19th century? Did you want to start and then we get back to John? I mean, I, I think if you talk about architecture that's more than, let's say, trying to be derivative of, of established architecture in the East and Europe, then it's probably around the end of the 19th century. The very end. So people like Morgan and Polk and Maybeck, uh, Coxhead and others, who start to you know who are you know were very critical right of the of the uh, there was extreme criticism of Victoriana among most of them, and uh, so I would say that moment when you know. When, Think about it, 1890s, the, very, you know, the, the, the European architecture of, of the, of the you know, 60 years old at, at most, even less, right? Uh, so maybe you know, less than half a century uh, and mostly bringing buildings from the East Coast, literally the whole building, or mm -hmm. you know, which was a common thing to bring, you know, ship the building. And then the styles, you know, to try to, you know. I think the conservative flowers was actually shipped like, from the East Coast. But... It, a lot of buildings were shipped. They call them you know, Boston buildings. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think I think around the turn of the century is when you start to get architects who have been here, who are now trained as architects, you know, because the profession really starts training people in the late 1860s and 70s, uh, yeah. or, you know, in, in the United States and or who've been to Europe. And I think by that point, you start to get architects of a higher level of sophistication who are resistant to just taking established styles uh, and, and mimicking them, you know, and want to do something that uh, I think it starts to accord with what we consider to be modernism, which is matching the architecture to the people who live and their, their, their needs, the kind of unique functions, matching the architecture to the climate and the topography, to the building materials, to evolving constructional technologies. You start to get that already. So that's about, it's over 100 years ago. So in that, even though they could be stylistic, yeah. you know, I mean, certainly all of them could. could Should we book uh, Louis Mulgar in it? Yeah, I mean, they all fit in that. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that was. I think that's the moment when things start to become interesting, you know. So more the sensibility than the style. Yeah, I don't uh, style. I, I've written a lot about style. Uh, doesn't you know? It's a strange. They, they're anti-style, right? I mean, at a certain point, you know, even though Maybeck could design in style, and, and you know, even Polk, right? But uh, I think you do start. It starts to get interesting. Things start to get interesting in the 90s and into the early 20th century. It's not modernism. Well, you know, it's it's Hefner's argument that, about the English arts and crafts being the, the roots of modernism. And this is kind of, I think, a That's our one point of view. Yeah, it's, it's his, but I, I think it has some validity, you know, that they're, they're, they're still, you know, they're, they're, there's still a nod to style, but, the other factors I mentioned are becoming much more prominent. So that's what I would say, you know, and obviously it's, you know, I think when I published the, the, that guide and, and history, people, I got criticized by some, I, I talked to some architectural historians and they're like, you've included so few buildings from the 19th century. And I said, yeah, <laughs> for a reason, you know, and I included a lot more from the 20th and later. So for, because I think that's when California starts to come into its own. You know, in the 20th century, clearly. Yeah. This is my uh, very quick bio. I grew up in Walnut Creek and I live in Berkeley. <clears throat> but having said that, I work for the San Francisco Chronicle. 
And I would almost, in some ways, and I think everything Mitchell is saying is right. I think in terms of just a pure thing you could see and go to and say, this is when there was a different air in the wind, so to speak, or breeze in the air, whatever, um, would be something like the Halliday building, you know, the curtain wall that Willis Polk did, which, I mean, Polk did a variety of styles, very much infused with this fighting for a modern sense of being in the Bay Area. There's a collected book of his reviews that he did anonymously, I think anonymously, like in the early 1890s, where he just excoriated oh, yeah. Victorian homes and the monstrosities of the Western edition, which at that time meant anything west of Bob Hill. Um, but, you know, with the, with the Howardy building, you see this total material break and this signal, there's a bigger world than ours. And we're tying into that. I mean, it, you know, you, you can argue the curtain walls overrated in some ways on that building, but it's fascinating that you've got this totally modern in spirit curtain wall. And then you've got these almost kind of Victorian filigrees going up in parts of it. You know, so it's that kind of, it's not like it's a clean break. It's not like me suddenly flew in and had his very early you know, well, what commission. Was, was 1917? Yeah, yeah, 1915, 1917, yeah, early. Yeah. You know, and, and it was also, it was in such a public place. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I think, a little of my bias writing for a general newspaper is that part of it is who actually sees it. And that was a building that went up half a block, not even a half a block from Montgomery Street. And that was the heart of the biggest financial district west of Chicago. You know, and so it kind of signaled there is a wider set of possibilities, set of possibilities than what we were seeing before. So Franklin Wright had for decades a model of a reinforced concrete high rise, which was called the McCall building, which was supposed to go I think on Fourth Street and uh, Market. It was like Third and Market. Third and Market, exactly. And uh, it never materialized, but he really liked the building. And uh, in uh, so there's this one missed opportunity, and then in uh, uh, tour uh, an architecture, or a new architecture by with the museum. He uses a Spreckles building as what not to do for the modern architect. So on one side of the area, San Francisco is used as a, as a playground for the implementation of a new language in uh, this technology. On the other is uh, the outpost of uh, traditions to demolish. Uh, and uh, how do you reconcile this view of the Bay Area from such giants uh, of our cultural discourse. I think, um, and if I'm remembering correctly, the Spreckles building was actually the call building that was built. So we're talking like the same site in San Francisco. And they've covered it now. It, it got, yeah, it's it, gone it, through the so, zone is gone. so many sad iterations. Yeah. But um, the <clears throat> Frank Floyd Wright tower that was proposed. It was a serious thing. It wasn't like his, hey, I've got an idea. What if we design a butterfly bay bridge? I mean, this was the client calling the potential architect kind of thing. Um, it was, it's in, I think the models in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, because I saw, I just went to an architecture exhibition there and the thing's like this high. I mean, his love for it is palpable because this is not, the cool little wooden model on a table. This is, you know, it's taller than always some of you in this room. Um, and Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> and that's a very good point. And Frank Lloyd Wright. 
So I mean, I, I guess what I would say is that is an early example of the fact there's never a single history or a single mm -hmm. point of view and that you get this tension and the Bay Area at it, certainly going back to the 1890s and things of what should we be? And, you know, it's kind of, are we building on our perceived past and honoring pasts and things? Or is it we're forging out into these new frontiers? And that's that's fascinating. And the fact that it was outsiders staking out both mm -hmm. points of view. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think you have to look at what one we're very far from other places in the world, especially then, although closer than we had been, right? Once you get the uh, steamship, the steel hulled steamship in the 1870s and then and the railroad. But I think that the that kind of there's a kind of desperation uh, because of the distance. So on the one hand, I think you know you see in California, it's, so LA fits very well with this too. It's not us alone. There's a tremendous enthusiasm for new technology. It's no accident that the I think that the computer, the microprocessor, was first built in in 1971. Uh, the computer, personal computer, kind of made its arrival here more than anywhere else, and the internet, and so, and so on. And you look at the, you know, the growth, you know, all the kind of communications technologies like film and photography, the modern communications technologies, radio. They were all, television was invented in some say by Philo Farnsworth in San Francisco in 1927. So we, there's this fascination with new technology but in part because people want to connect with other parts of the world so it's a kind of dual you know they want to and then you know we, very very enthusiastic as we must all of us know the automobile adoption right through the early 20th century really enthusiastic for airways and, re and airfields so there's that right and then there's, you know, so there's this very reaching out and making connections and in California becoming, trying to become a node in a worldwide network, which fits with, and then, but then you look at architecture, you know, the field of architecture, right? I mean, what's so striking to me at, in the, you know, is that architecture wasn't a global discipline. Franklin Wright is really an outlier, right? He's unbelievable. In terms of, I mean, this guy is building everywhere from Tokyo, you know, to Florida, to California, to the Midwest. You know, it, it, you can't go anywhere and not run across the Franklin Wright. But there's no one else like him, really. There's, it's very unusual, right? Certainly in the first half of the 20th century. It just, you don't see that. You don't see McKinley Boy coming out to California, you know, and, and the like, you know. And there's this gradual uh, gra architecture gradually becomes much more international, but it's a new, you know, so there aren't many examples of other architects, you know, you know designing here. You know, it, it, it's really the 30s when the Germans come over to the United States, and then after the Second World War, you start to get a degree of internationalism, but it's really nothing compared to now. I'd say, so I'd say the last 30 years are much more extensive. So I think there are these dual these dual factors going on. On the one hand, California wants to adopt technologies, wants to connect with the world, wants to uh, be part of things, and at the same time, and, and so that points to, well, some of the things they want to be part of are kind of old-fashioned and traditional. Like, I, I, I still admit, I live near Piedmont, like right on the border of Oakland and Piedmont, and I walk in Piedmont all the time. It's very, nobody there, you know, really, it's like, it's almost like a park. Uh, but not quite. And I, 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 you know, what are the percentage of really interesting modern buildings in Piedmont? Very few, very few. And the same, in Berkeley might have a few more. San Francisco, not that many. So if you walk in, say, for all the neighborhoods, right, that were developed, you know, and and you wonder about that, right? You say and Los Angeles has the same issue, right? A little more, maybe. Uh, but there's this tendency, you know, for developers to inspire firms that do more traditional work all through the 
the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you know. And so it's a countervailing tradition in California. So on the one hand, and I think another, I, I would I would add to that is um, you're talking about a society that is so different, let's say, than Europe, for sure, than, than France or England or Germany, but even different from Philadelphia, New York, Chicago. You know, the, the, the clients, most of them weren't from here, right? They moved here. Everyone moves here. <laughs> Uh, so I think when you start to think about the social environment of the clients and and the, even the architects who moved here, a lot of them moved here. It, it is it it um, you get those dual motivations. Let's we move here. We want to make something new in California. We move here. We want to make connections with the places that we came from. So I think that I think in a lot of ways there I think that the contradiction. Of California architecture, that it's not this bold movement, you know, into modernism all the time, or even most of the time, which, it, which some of us would have liked to look. Uh, it, it makes sense if you think about the social environment, the ge geography, the technological orientation. So it looks like the, one of the, for me, the Achilles heels of. Uh, uh, historical discourse is the emphasis on the individuals and their capacity to produce uh, uh, an enormous amount of work in the absence of seeing where they're producing it. So uh, the, the West Coast is shared by Oregon and is shared by Washington, but the level of, and, and you know, there's some groups of people between the Bay Area and, and, and Los Angeles, but the level of activity that took place in the metropolitan area is uh, uh, of global impact. I mean, there's a, there's a tremendous influx of people coming from all over the world, creating fundamentally a trans transnational society. It, it just happened to, I mean, I'm a result of that. Uh, the, you are too, probably. I mean, you certainly are. I don't know about you. You're probably second, third generation from somewhere. Born in Texas. Okay, great. But I mean, that ultimately, well, it, it's yeah. a recent history, and uh, and this this percentage business you talk about. I was in Europe for three weeks ago for three weeks in different parts, uh, and, and and this gradation of quality, it's the same there. I mean, it's not that everybody's filled with modernity. Even Berlin wasn't back. Oh, okay, everywhere you go, but. The opportunities are here are uh, truly distinctive on a global perspective. So how does architecture respond to that? And uh, part of us asking these questions, I know you guys are spent a significant amount of time thinking about these issues, is how does this history, which is uh, eclectic in nature, reflects itself in the construction of the present and the future of this city? So. I have three questions um, for you in sequence, but they're important. Um, uh, I had a conversation with uh, a, an English scholar. He said, oh, yeah, uh, who is interested in construction history from our future perspective. Oh, yes, California is great. All buildings are assemblages. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is such an interesting thing, because we don't manufacture really anything. We just assemble things. And, and the culture of assemblage mm -hmm. create the idea that you can disassemble buildings as well, and it creates a likeness to the building that the East Coast doesn't have the same way that the structural member of beef here that, that, that you can. I, I saw this thing when I work on the book on Ezra Stoller, so the whole archive. I mean, stuff is just a little bulkier than the one that we have here. So I'm just wondering, from your perspective, do you see this notion of building as assemblage, as informing? a certain kind of lightness in architecture for the Bay Area. A, a part of it obviously can be translated in California as well, but also in, that, in its architectural expression, since uh, locality is such an important part of this conversation, mm -hmm. be rooted in this place. Can you give an example of what you like a building? Well, I mean, the, the Richmond Assembly plant uh, by, by Albert Kahn was uh, a building that was assembled. The, 
buildings that don't have a technology where you need to pour concrete, but it's just a prefabricated shift and, and assemble. That's the idea of, uh, of having buildings that have a lightness and movability and therefore a transient element into them. They're, gonna, they're not going to stick around anymore. And so inevitably, the, the, the urban fabric has uh, a, an ongoing transformation taking place, which happens in all cities, but it here seems a, a, a particular. Is this from an English architect? Uh, yes. So there, there's this whole, there's a, there's a, um, well, it was an English scholar. There's a, there's a, a magazine called Construction History, and it, it all started with some observations by John Summerson in the 80s, and it just kept going. And they are looking at, the, for example, the production of steel versus the production of concrete. Mm -hmm. We have a production of steel in the United States, therefore we have a steel architecture. There is no production of steel to the same level in Spain, therefore they have a concrete architecture. And, you know, with glass and copper and everything else. So, I think you can, I think, I mean, a big part of the California vernacular is, and this is not in the architectural history books, but just simple things like barns and sheds and everything. That you see, you know, you still see driving through um, Sonoma, driving through the Central Valley, driving the road up to Sacramento, 80. Um, you could do that because of the climate that you, you know, a lot of the part of the country you have to, you know, until this winter, you have to defend against very big storms. And that wasn't necessary elsewhere. And then I think also, um, the forgivingness of the climate kicks in with so much of the growth here was kind of post-World War II. And, and again, I grew up in Walnut Creek. And uh, if I was an architectural historian on an academic staff with tenure, I mean, the vernacular modernism that you see in these suburbs that grew fast is just wonderful. And it's stuff that's never going to get preserved, unfortunately. Like, um, if you're ever in Walnut Creek, there's this incredible, to me, and I have no idea who the architect is. I, I, it's not like, you know, somebody, it's not like Chuck Bassett went out there to do a miniature or something. <laughs> but it's um, a cleaners. And it's a cleaners that consists of double height glass and concrete block kind of forming the brace, probably the stairs are behind that. And it's just building this like pure modernism. And it's just some guy had to build, Walnut Creek grew really fast in the mid fifties to mid sixties. Somebody needed to build a cleaner. So they hired some probably architect who had leafed through some book and thought, well, this is cool. And you don't need to worry about, oh, but how will it keep out snow? How will it keep out hurricanes? And so you just have, you know, if, if you were to drive up into, uh, there's um, much closer, is in El Cerrito, there's the horrible shopping center by the El Cerrito BART station uh, with the luckies and things that's just, Horrible, horrible, horrible. And it's gotten better with age. It's not like I can see the virtues of it 20 years later. Uh, there's this little building that is on the, the street just north where it goes out. And you come down from the BART station just before you get to San Pablo on the left. This little brick building with these super steep vertical columns. Um, but I mean, columns, like kind of arches. So it's this modern building with these brick arches, compressed, double height. It's like, who did that? Where did it come from? And it's got like a recess, almost colonnade within it, except it's only about eight feet wide. And, you know, it's just the kind of thing that probably was just built by some clever local guy with a contractor and they just tossed it out and put it all about it. You know, there's a lot of that stuff. And I think that's a testimony to the lightness of the earth, mm -hmm. that you could do something like that. You know, I, I, it's, it, it's interesting when I remember being in Britain and talking to a, a, with a Frenchman, and you know, he was like, "This is not architecture; it's all brick, <clears throat> not substantial." In France, we have stone, and he was very critical of 
English architecture for that reason, all the brick. Then, of course, if you come to California, you'd be like, what is this just wooden wood framing with stuff out of this, you know, board is this is not. So I think it, it depends on you know your set your distance from the metropolitan mm -hmm. center, which was Rome and you know solid, you know. I it, it I, I think yes, of course, climate allows us you know, allowed our you know the design of buildings. It, 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 San Francisco is probably one of the most. I mean, can you think of another world city that has as much wood as San Francisco? I mean, I don't can't think of you know Helsinki. What Helsinki? Oh. I was in there last year. As much wood everywhere. Oh, there are a lot of it. Yeah, <laughs> I I was there. Yeah, it's not, but not like San Francisco is a wooden city. I mean, it's it's remarkable, uh, and it makes sense given you know the ch it's the you know, cheapness of construction, right? What? Yeah, the Hotel. I mean, yeah, and there were a lot of large buildings, large wooden hotels at first because they're, they're a lot in the, in the Bay Area. So, you know, I think a lot of the, you know, it, it makes sense that there was, you know, I mean, steel is interesting. You bring up steel. We, you know, there's no, there's no iron ore in California. Mm -hmm. There's not even any iron ore close to California. In fact, the California, when there were steel plants in San Francisco and Berkeley and Oakland, it was mostly recycled steel that they, they, they would bring from elsewhere. And when they built products with steel, they were actually assembling them rather than using the word assembly. They were assembling the products rather than, you know, building, the, you know, actually forging the steel and then using local steel. They were taking steel from elsewhere, just assembling them. Uh, even though we have, you know, automobile assembly plants, but there was so the, the closest steel is in Utah, yeah. and there was only a short, and, they, and it wasn't economical until the late 1950s, and you, that's when you get the first big steel plant. U.S. Steel opened the plant in Pittsburgh, uh, and then closed it 30 years later. It didn't last very long. So. It's funny, yeah. We think we, you know, we, we had there was a lot of building in steel, but it wasn't from a local steel industry. Uh, and certainly to this day, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at any, you know, what, what's going up, if it's seven stories or less, it's going to be wood on top of a concrete base, right? So it, we're still building in wood, you know. Uh, and I think even though now it's much easier with container shipping to. To ship, you know, to ship the materials elsewhere, but I think it's we we didn't we I don't think we built in steel as opposed to concrete because of local steel production. So it's I'm not I, I, it's more of an American phenomenon, right? Well, across the country, right? Well, it was particularly pronounced in California precisely because it was so remote, and then uh, the, more steel than elsewhere. Well, no, no, no. I mean the idea the idea of of uh, thinking of building as an assemblage. Of, 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 which means fast construction, which means uh, also uh, easier also to dismantle, and this uh, this uh, immobility of the building, but that they become mobile precisely for the very reason. And so, so it, it creates a new notion of the city itself that keeps so, uh, constantly changing. It goes back to the balloon frame, right? Also partially, but I mean, but but I mean, I find that all of these elements are all uh, folded into each other into a society that. That grew in terms of population very rapidly, so more more housing was needed. I mean, if you just look at the chronology of how uh, California I mean, exploded in the population and what Caltrans did to attend to it with all this uh, uh, networking, I mean, Caltrans is an extraordinary place uh, for also for. Uh, material testing in their labs in Sacramento. There's a tremendous amount of uh, work that they have done, which is largely unaccounted in conventional architecture history, which focused so much on, on people, right? And on the specifics. Um, that goes a, a bit back to, the, to another issue, which is more specific to the Bay Area. Um, here we, uh, we have a, a, a tremendous traditional landscape architecture. 
So we have Thomas Church, and we have Larry Alfring, and Gary Echo was here, and Alton Sanders. It's a long list. And the integration of architecture and landscape uh, seem to be like a cornerstone of the identity of the place. You cannot say the same thing in other places, but Harvard did have that as well with their you know, scholarship uh, and, 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 and tradition of uh, uh, training that. Uh, do you believe that that value has stayed in today's practice? That the architecture and landscape are thought as an environmental totality? And yet, you know, just think that, for example, an architect like Joseph Einstein, who had this book published, uh, by his work, had his, uh, the intro done by Eric Echo as a book on architect. We're just uh, thinking the importance of uh, connecting with nature. And, you know, nature, I spoke recently with Herb Green, and many of you probably you know Herb Green, who was in the of Bruce Gaw. I said, for me, architecture is about nature. Well, what nature, though? The prairie. Because I was in Finland. Well, Al doesn't think about the prairie. We're thinking about the lakes. But what is our nature, the nature that we have here, that would feed the architectural expression and, and, and the organization of the, of the built environment and the natural one as well? So could you comment on that? You know, I, I think mid-century, uh, it's well, what's interesting is that when Expo and the rest of them were working, the average lot size for, for oh, let's say a middle class, upper middle class dwelling unit was much was at the largest in history. And it went up and then it went down. And what I think you're seeing now is uh so yeah, when you look at these new estates that are being built, right? uh for the for the ultra rich and, and that's something that we, we should definitely talk about is you know when we talk about what's interesting mid-century we're talking about an era of high taxation government based on the second world war right the, the tax rates of the second world war continue into the 50s 60s and into the early 70s very high taxation a lot a lot of more government services uh and a kind of probably they, the French call it the 30 great glorious years. Les 30 glorieuses, the 30 great years, 45 to 75. Uh, when workers, working class people had the best ride they've ever had in history. And now they don't, they're bitter. So you had that, right? You had that, I mean, mid-century modern occurs during that period, right? When uh, those wonderful landscape gardens, some of them weren't even that large, you know, are happening during this wonderful period uh, of a kind of a more egalitarian society, the most we've ever had. And then, you know, with neoliberalism, with Reagan, Reaganomics and onward, we've moved in the opposite direction, right? And as a lot of us know, the wealth and wage inequalities are back to where they were before, you know, back in the, the Gilded Age, really getting worse and worse. And, you know, I, I, I'm doing this modernist map for the AIA, that's uh, annual conference, it's not a modernist, it's a contemporary map. It's gonna be, I did a modernist, uh, a one for modernism from the thirties to the seventies. Now I'm doing one from the eighties to now. And I thought about, well, should we do the whole Bay Area? And then, you know, and I realized, well, you can't go to Silicon Valley campuses. You can't just go and visit them. I, I've tried. Uh, you know, they have gates and, 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 and perimeter fences, so you can't even see them. Whereas you, you could, can't, you can't even. The architects can't even show you photographs mm -hmm. as they have their non-disclosure agreements, and they get. You want to go see Bjork Ingels, you know, the, the, the Google campus or the Apple campus, like, you know, you can't. It's very, very hard to go see these buildings, and then the houses are even harder because you know, I, I for the for that the guy when I was doing, looking at modernism, I was oh, there's a. And Elwood and Hillsborough, and go, and I could actually go up to it because that was the way things were built back then. Yeah. Now, if, if you want to see the, you know, let's say the latest Anne Fougeron, yeah, you know, oh, it's be, it's like on 25 acres and it's behind, there's they've got perimeter conifer walls, you don't see anything, you know. So there's a whole different mentality, and, and you know, I mean, the Donnell Garden, you can actually see it from a, you know. The, the area around it, you know. But, I mean, it's the idea of uh, of thinking them as one uh, 
I, I, I'm working on a couple of projects, and I, the, the fees of the landscape architects are significantly less than those of the architect. And therefore, the, it, it often it happens as, as an afterthought, as a yeah. remedial thing, but as something. It doesn't I'm come together. I, and so I'm just wondering. Uh, I, can't, I haven't seen those because I can't even get to them. I can't see these new tech campuses. I can't see these new houses. None of, hardly any of us can. They're so privatized now. Yeah, you know, there's a forest inside the apple donut. There's, which seems yeah. like very interesting, but, but you can't, can't even you can't get to it. So it's like it's. Just, I think that mentality is not going to help, right? Foster like, oh, it's rather important, you know. It, it's interesting. That, I mean, and and I've written about Silicon Valley less and less as journalism's changed and everything. But my review of the Apple headquarters was to go to the visitor center. <laughs> which is built almost to the standard, presumably, of the thing that the cars they would let you in. Oh, they had, I even think, though you're saying I'm writing for the center, oh, no interest. No, they, they have their, like their piece for Wired magazine type of thing. Um, but there's a visitor center you can go to, and you can go up on the second floor and look across. And I really recommend you go to the Apple Visitor Center. And you go down to the basement where the bathrooms are, and it's like you've entered. The most exquisite Norman Foster design catacombs of all time, these stone walls. And just, anyway, but um, no, the closed down part is totally true. And also, like architects say, oh, I'm doing this great project for a company I can't tell you about in a Silicon Valley center <laughs> city I can't reveal. But boy, I'll show you the, the drawings because they're cool. But I would argue, though, landscape architecture in the, at the public scale. Uh, the Bay Area tradition has held on very strongly. And I think in some ways it has continued to grow and morph in a way that the architecture communities have problems with, like in the time I've been writing about this, because I just get the impression the cost of living is so high. But, you know, in the last, we'll say 10 or 15 years, I started writing about architecture and urban design in the early 2000s. Um, there haven't been a lot of new firms that have kind of risen in prominence. Not that firms from the 80s or 90s don't get good new staff and keep a strong heritage going, but you don't see a lot of new blood. And landscape architecture, I think you see more of it because there's an interest in, and this goes back into like it or hate it, you know, Market Street in San Francisco. We're going to bring in Halprin. We're going to bring in you know, we're going to do this public landscape that's really designed, which I don't think you have as much of elsewhere. And you're even, even, I think you're completely right. I think if you look at the last 15 years from Chrissy Field to the Salesforce Garden on top of the transit center to the tunnel tops and the, and the batteries, it, it, there was never a period when you had that quality landscape architecture for, in public parks in San Francisco. Or something like Crane Cove Park. Crane Cove Park is great. Yeah, I mean, Crane Cove Park is an example of that. There's so many of them now. Uh, it's not happening in the East Bay? Or Brooklyn Basin? A little bit, that one park. Township yeah. Commons, right? I think it's part of the East Bay is a lot poorer. San Francisco mm -hmm. has money, unfortunately. You're not seeing a lot of it in Berkeley and Oakland. Uh, uh, but no, but 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 yeah, I mean, really, interrupt real quick and pick up on Bryce because, like, at Brooklyn Basin, you've got Township Common, which Heinwiller Cool Keel. 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 I know Sarah Keel, but like putting her at the back of yeah. Um, you know, and these are two young architects, they left are youngish now, but they left Peter Walker's firm. And you have a local developer who wanted to show some local cred, so he'll hire the local landscape architects, and they just did this incredibly imaginative thing. And that was very much, it just kind of bubbled out of the East to the East Bay. And, you know, it's the architects, though, he kind of hired your basic knock out the eight-story housing box or the 12-story housing box. Frames. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, landscape architecture is healthy. Uh, in part. Well, I mean, yes, yes. So it's just for me, I mean, I've realized that uh, an aspect of this uh, 
is a byproduct of our overexposure to architectural photography. Photography tends to put the camera um, at the building facades and simply assigns a secondary role to the ground plane, which perceptually is exactly the opposite. And so people, I mean, architects get enamored with random patterns and all sorts of things uh, at the expense of the actual ground condition, which is what we, it's hard to get fall in love with a movie and not, not much as uh, the hardware can be engaging, but uh, give me a bench. So um, there was an architect uh, called Jan Lubitznitz, uh, Polish born, who at 32, uh, produce an extraordinary vision for the Golden Gateway Apartments. In 32. Uh, I was he was 32 years old. Oh, he was 32 years old. I mean, the first phase. Uh, well, I mean, just when they were doing uh, the, the, the master plan and the whole thing. And then he won uh, uh, one competition after the other. Uh, the one at uh, the Golden Gate Apartment was praised by Yamasaki and Khan. They were in, uh, in the jury. And then they did another one, Rock Hill Housing. He partnered with Marquis and Stoller. And he never built a thing. Anyone? They never let him build anything. He only, he only built one project for, because at some point he had to make a living. He just couldn't go on like that. And he built a design for John Bowles. Uh, the McGraw Hill distribution plant in um, on the way to Santa Rosa, which we always hear about the Birkenstock. Oh, oh, he's, he's, so he's the one that did. Nice, yeah. It's a fantastic. Yeah. Hat. So I his archive is at the San Francisco Public Library. Someone hit me up for that, and I was just completely blown away. There's no mention. I mean, I wrote a paper as yet to be published, but uh, there's no mention to him in any history books of any kind. And that was a, an amazing opportunity for San Francisco to provide a new skyline. This um, was a moment where there was actually this kind of a, a landscape uh, urbanism that thing would, it was just grabbing from the side and creating a series of forms that were just absolutely dazzling and uh, they, they made sense and he tested them and also in a, in a number of other competitions. At Golden Gateway. Gateway. Well, they gave away Rock Hill Housing and they did a few others in San Francisco and then Tel Aviv and uh, in um, Spain and they never let him build anything. Were they? Like a... Well, I mean, it's just like uh, you get the first prize and they, it's like you get but I can't build ten, ten Pompidou centers. He never built one, and that's a pretty good first. So he actually somehow didn't. Well, I mean, his his didn't get built, but but the issue is that he was here with San Francisco. He lived. Here. And he lived here, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, it kind of Worcester kind of crushed him because he was very young. So this is kind of a textbook case of uh, an opportunity for a young. Uh, voice to emerge in a in a, in a way that would significantly change uh, the skyline of the city, and it didn't happen. It, do we have in the city a history of these missed opportunities, or do you see more realizations uh, uh, throughout his twentieth century and now well into the twenty first century? Um, what's your point of view on this? Uh, is the city welcoming of these uh, revolutionary ideas? I'll just answer real quick. Um, <clears throat> I'm working on a book about self-promotion, a book about the ferry building that will come back, come out in November. And uh, the middle section is the period when the ferry building was a relic and just what do you do with this thing, like from 1939 to 1989? And the focus of the book is all the unbuilt visions that came along, and some were the big establishment ones. But San Francisco has a fascinating, like a shadow landscape, and some of it is the real visionary stuff. It just was not connected or too far ahead of the curve or anything like that. And in some ways, any big city has a lot of that, but San Francisco is fascinating. 
And, you know, my editor, I turned in the first version of the first draft and he was like, I don't want to read about a bunch of stuff that didn't get built. <laughs> so it's kind of like, so my my unbuilt my my many sideways into the unbuilt landscape became the unpublished part of the book. <laughs> so it's like pick one per chapter. No, it's it's I think San Francisco, you get this real creativity, but it also it runs up against reality. Like the Burnham plan. But is it a reality of uh, of uh... Uh, a conservative, conservative real estate approach, because you know the Trans America Pyramid was built ultimately, and it was a, a kind of a different building. But the U.S. Steel Building wasn't built. Well, I mean, I'm sure we we, we have plenty of other buildings that were not. That was built. supposed to be on a, on pier. It was built in the bay. It's supposed to be in the bay. Kind of egregious. Well, there was also uh, back. Mr. Fuller had a whole trapezoidal thing in the middle of the bay that, that we're going to be built. And they're, they're utopian projects just because that there are real things that could have been built. The Kenzo Congo Sports Stadium. I mean, I remember when I was a Skidmore brand needed a Sofitel building that was fantastic. It was, it was fantastic. I just couldn't believe they didn't build it. It was so obviously beautiful. And I was, this, this was on second and uh, mission near yeah, first. you remember. Which yeah, and it was approved when I started writing, and then uh -huh. it fell through, and then something else was going to get built, and that fell through, and then it was going to be Norman Foster's hotel to go with the building that's now a hole in the ground. It's a, oh, yeah, it's a jinx site, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a gorgeous, yeah, it was a gorgeous, yeah, yeah. yeah but that's, I would agree, I think that's pretty much every city, I don't know, right? Has these things that didn't happen. Well, New York has some remarkable high rises, though. I mean, uh, you mean recent? Well, I mean, just there's a, there's a tradition of building tall that has. You uh, think we don't have remarkable high rises? No, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I, I'm just, I, I guess the reason why I'm bringing this up is are, do we have the conditions for new great work? to be present and be in good company of previous work. Because I always think that uh, the city is uh, is evolving, but it builds on what is already in there. I mean, it's the other look, part. I, look, when I, like, I moved back, I, I moved here a couple of times. I lived here in the 80s and then I was gone for a while. And I came back in the 95. When I got back, the climate, I wrote an article about the San Francisco in the age of reaction. Uh, and reaction was that, you know, we had a very strong postmodernism. Mm -hmm. You know, it started here in some ways. Charles Moore was, you know, you know, the, the Citizen Savings Bank on Market Street, the Lorinda House, you know, this is early 60s. So, uh, very strong postmodernism. And, you know, um, and uh, there was a real resistance, you know, to our architecture. You know, this was considered a lousy architecture town. Uh, 25 years ago, a very hard town to work in. And there were a few people laboring, you know, like Jim Jennings and Stanley Fayley, they were kind of, you know, and I feel like, well, will it ever develop into a an exciting community? And I think it has. I think it's been a tremendous transformation that I've seen in these last 27, 28 years from a town where, you know, I worked at the planning department in the 80s on the downtown plan, not the part with where we decided what how buildings should be designed, the you know the three the tripartite. But I worked on the preservation part, which I'm still happy with. Um, and and we and then it's only we moved development to the south of market. You know, if you notice, there hasn't been much built north of market since then, since the mid '80s. Uh, but th there was this reactionary mood that was pervasive like i i was hired by the, the young museum to actually go to 15 community meetings in the early 2000s to sell the young to sell the herzog and the Mara idea to community groups you know in like the lake street quarter community group the outer richmond all these groups you know and so i heard you know firsthand the attitude you know, and people like, well, I remember my favorite story was someone was like, there's going to be a tower. And I was like, yes, there is. There's, there's part of the plan is a tower. They're like, 
does that mean we'll see it? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, the word tower <laughs> implies it's a tall vertical, you know, structure that is seen from long distances. They're like, oh no, then there was a brick, brick you know, we don't want to see it. They wanted a tower you couldn't see. Uh, an invisible tower. But you know, and I think, I think and we were trying to figure this out, you know, this mentality, because it was in Berkeley too a lot, very strong. Bert, you know, the Baja, you know, uh, the heritage group. And you know, we thought, well, it had a lot to do with the fact that people came here from elsewhere, and this was they found paradise. They didn't come this winter, you know, <laughs> where they found flooding and those, but they came here and they found paradise, right? You know, and they didn't want it to change. That was kind of one of the, they wanted it to stay the way it was when they got here, a village, as opposed to a real big city, you know, and, uh, and I think that, that was an, that, so we, I think we suffered a lot, you know, in, through the 80s and early into the 90s. And, and I think there's a reason this, this reaction happened is partly because of the overbuilding that happened during the mid-century, not individual houses, but you know, the three-way system you mentioned, you know, the urban renewal plans, you know, which were racist in, 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 in every which way. And, you know, there was a kind of overbuilding and there was a reaction to the overbuilding, right? The freeway revolt started in the panhandle, in the Haight, you know, when the Haight was a really interesting neighborhood, but it's the, the part of the Haight's genesis was reaction against, you know, so I think it has changed. I, I think it's gotten yeah. much better. So, you know, but I feel compelled to play the 12 language sure, sure, sure. role in the sense that there was always a modernity in the Bay Area, always. In the 80s? No, in, in, the, in the 20th century, there, wa there was, uh, there was uh, uh, the work of Ernest Ransom, uh, uh, the engineer that kind of uh, patented the twisted rod at the same time as Ennepik was doing his work in France. Uh, you know, California Academy of Science was on 4th Street, was an incredible building, and we did back there like four inch uh, slabs, and, and nobody had ever seen any of that. So the conditions for for primary work were present. Um, we had extraordinary architects doing work here. Mendelssohn came here, John E. Kingdon, we didn't know what he talks about him. He was a disciple of Sarah and extraordinary work that did throughout the forties and from the thirties all the way to the fifties. Uh, um, Fred and Lois Langhorst, uh, smaller work, but then going into bigger work. Ashen and Allen in the period of Bob Ashen, fantastic work. Uh, Norman Foster was in Ashen and Allen when Richard Rogers was in SNI being kicked out by Chuck Bassett. So, I mean, this is not a uh, an occasional arrival of rates. I mean, this is an ongoing place where people happen to arrive. But the representation of that history is particularly selective and it's very self-serving. And, and part of my work has been precisely to crack this open because you cannot account for Donaldson uh, using the Bay Region style. Bay Region style, which uh, Elizabeth Betty Thompson, Elizabeth Kendall Thompson was a West Coast editor of architectural record. Uh, in her own writings, regretted having come up with that idea herself. And uh, uh, that, uh, that, the notion was kept alive by Danny Gepper. But if you try to do a search in the Debbie Gepper archive, who died in 96 and 97, they haven't even opened the boxes. <laughs> they are, it's still in process. So we have inherited a very biased history that has kicked out Beverly Thorne, that has kicked out... Uh, but it hasn't now. Well, I mean, it's, you have done some of it. Uh, I've done some of it, but but it hasn't become mainstream to the point where there's an ease, the way Los Angeles has done, the way New Canaan has done, right? I mean, New York has, uh, and even Philadelphia, you know, there's some amazing uh, uh, moments, Chicago, the Bay Area has this kind of a 
is this really our history? And and uh, and I, again, we have extensive uh, evidence that that was our history. Even Escher himself, the the, the residential work was absolutely phenomenal. I, I think phenomenal. I think, I think there is another thing when I talk to you know the architects practicing today who are doing really interesting work. They are aware of the fact that there was some really great work earlier, and they're also aware that there was this period. I think I think it's roughly from the mid 70s to the yeah. mid 90s when it was very hard but that so that was more the average period well don't you think that this was was, a, a, was somewhat national because of the crisis of the modernity right it was, like, it was, was, it was, it was definitely national but i think yeah. it was worse here than other places because of the, i think the reaction was stronger and I, but i think we've recovered from that I, I, well but i think one reason the reaction was stronger was that you had these exquisite architects in the Bay Area, some homegrown, some from Germany and everything. And there was this interest as the city grew so dramatically in the 60s, there was this interest in turning to them. Um, and one could argue that they really botched the job. Mm -hmm. They kind of knocked up a bunch of big things that kind of so made the very concept of modernity radioactive at the mm -hmm. grand public level. Uh, which is kind of similar to Boston, you know. I mean, Boston. Anyone who knows Boston, government. Uh, no, 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 no. But this is what I'm going to say. The idea that historic Boston for about 20 years was this bubbling cauldron of modern art, you know, it's incredible buildings. Like, hey, we'll hire Paul Rudolph to do a church. Hey, we'll have a national competition and give city hall to these brand new guys i lived in boston in the 80s that was not the mood of boston in the 80s it was like what kind of feel i think one thing that i haven't heard is that the bay area has the venice syndrome i think unlike new york chicago and other places it's a gorgeous place and it really drives everything so people are afraid that buildings are going to harm the beauty of this that was the word. And they called it Manhattanization. <laughs> that was the term. Right. You know what's you know what's ironic though about the whole thing is that that what what I think changed the climate for exciting new architecture was the young tech you know, all those people moving in. But at the same time, a lot of people would claim they destroyed San Francisco. So it became unaffordable, it became homogeneous. And yet you could build interesting modern, you could build interesting architecture now. And that's the kind of situation we have. We have these wonderful new parks, a lot of great new buildings, but a city that has become more homogeneous at any time in its history, I think, in terms of where people work. You know, it used to be that people worked in shipping or they worked in the railroad industry or they worked in apparel or they worked in uh, food, food companies, companies that do with food or companies that had to do with apparel, you know, with uh, finance. All of that, almost all of that's gone, right? That, that kind of diversified economy. There was also a huge blue collar, sport and industry world, you know, employment, that's gone. And now it's largely, up, you know, white collar tech. And so on the one hand, we have, I think, much more interesting architecture now because they're open to that. And we don't, we have a city that's become much more homogeneously rich and and tech oriented and so it's 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 again one of those contradictions that you have here it's impossible to connect between that mid-century period and where we are today because these these conversations and issues are very active you know here in 2023 um you know bringing up and this will lead to a question a couple of questions for you then so bringing up two places um two designs and two i'll just call them tragedies um, you know, the Oakland CCAC campus, the Vernon and Mars buildings, the very particular Northern California vernacular regional expressions of, on the one hand, the painting studio with the Redwood and the library and lecture hall with the concrete, you know, brutalist forms. And then in San Francisco, Pat Repeat and Clay Art Institute. Um, you know, both of these are on the chopping block, literally. And, you know, as we talk about and sort of 
low energy ways about the planning plan or about the pulp or whatever. You know, these buildings are from the late 60s and they're actively being torn down now. <clears throat> Listening to this talk about the modernist guy, yeah, I imagine folks in this room respect this building. But, you know, have we learned anything, right? I mean, Penn Station, rallying cry, the Imperial Hotel, rallying cry. But here we are in our own area, Oakland, North Oakland, they're tearing it down. Well, Penn Station. Uh, downtown San Francisco, North Beach, they're tearing it down. I think so. I, I mean, I'm having, yeah, so, so, so I think since you came to the heading to the question part. So, you know, these institutions, they go for, let's remember that these buildings are usually owned by institutions, by the government, etc. The institutions, they go broke, and then the buildings are torn down. Um, it's important to have press that, and local participation to be active about understanding these buildings and properly preserving them. And then I guess I sort of lead into you know your folks and your perspectives and expertise. You know where does where does or should preservation stand in all besides the academic, but actual preservation? You know we have things like forty million people here. We have a growing population. We have the housing element, which says we need to build more housing. So in all of that context, what should be saved? And then maybe on a more whimsical note, if you look back over, let's say, the last 40 years or 50 years or something like that, what should be saved? So, um, you know, what should be saved and maybe some examples of that? Well, we, I, I taught in the Founders Hall for 20 years. Yeah. It, it, I, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like when I see, if I see a wrecking wall there, it's going to be really a hard moment. Um, you know, the college had a, had a ceremony to say goodbye to the Oakland campus. And I was like, they're saying goodbye, but they're actually, <laughs> they're responsible for trying to tear down almost everything. So I didn't say anything. I was good about, you know, I wanted to, but it was like, this is, this is a, a farce. They're going to tear, tear down every, everything, but the Victorian and the carriage house. The Victor Mackey Hall and the character. They're going to tear down the Jennings Sculpture Studio. They're going to tear down the Vernon de Mar. They want to tear down everything. Um, and I think it brings up this issue that has befuddled me ever since I've lived here. And it is the weakness of institutions in, in California. I remember going to the uh, Kimball Museum in, in Texas, in Fort Worth once, and I was blown away, not just by the architecture, by the collection. The phenomenal collection. It was assembled in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And I, then I go to the Dion or the Legion. I'm like, what happened? Why did they get a collection of that quality? And we got, you know, dross. And, and then why did CCA give up the open campus? Why did the artists go under? Why did if you might have heard, Holy Names College has gone under. Mills College went under, was rescued by Northeastern. It's not going to be Mills College anymore. It's going to be Northeastern, at least there's going to be a college there. You know, there's this, we are losing a lot of John F. Kennedy University, which was in Arinda, then in Pleasant Hill, they went under. Uh, it's so common now. We, we have so few institutions here. The Oakland Tribune is gone. There's this thing called the East Bay Times that is an unrecognized, you know, you know, the Mercury News used to be a quite a decent newspaper. It's not anymore. So we've lost a lot of institutions. The, you know, Oakland has lost two sports teams. It's going to lose a third. They'll have zero. So I wonder about these things. Like what is what has happened? You know, the East Bay Express used to be one of the best alternative weeklies anywhere. I remember it was a phenomenal. They had 25,000 word investigative essay in the East Bay Express. Now, if you look at it now, it's like almost nothing. What has happened? What's going on? And, and, and I don't have a good answer for this. You know, why does Berkeley have no more movie theaters? Zero. We're just only the PFA and, and the Elmwood. You know, the downtown has no movie theaters from, from having like, I think there were like 30 screens at one point downtown. Now there are zero. I, I don't quite know what's happening because you know, I've been what I've been wondering all along, like why we have this incredible concentration of talent and brain power and money, and yet we're losing institutions left and right, left and right. And, and I don't quite. And so the, the the case of the two 
you know, campuses that you're talking about is just illustrative of this phenomenon that no one, you know. And I didn't mean to get dark and add darkness into the dark, but you know, you were sort of head, uh, heading for the note of like there's this phrase, you know, feeling of good architects and all that. But these institutions matter and this preservation matters. And um, we're talking romantically about some, you know, design themes. But you know, back to what which things should be preserved, right? When I think it brings up should, should, should we preserve the uh, beyond? Yeah, I, preserve think it brings up what, I think it brings up what Pierre alluded to brought up earlier, just with individualism, this tradition. There just isn't a, a, a you know, those who are from other parts of the world, there's just either a, there's either a strong media presence and discourse, uh, which unfortunately sorry to say we don't have in large part and uh we just don't have that kind of institution building you know they, they well but the thing is though the institution building is building new things and this goes all through the strands of bay area history i was an intern in cincinnati which has an and this is going way back into the 80s you had your Cincinnati families who were determined to show this was a big city with real culture. So the museums were good and everything like that. The city was dying. I went back five or six years later. I've been back several times since. And you have like this kind of German heritage and you still have the wealthy families putting things in so the institutions survive, but the whole city was dying around it. You know, it, it didn't make it out of the eight. It's not Detroit, but it came out pretty haphazardly. The Bay Area, someone comes here and they're going to create the new thing. And so the Art Institute was the new thing, you know, and that's where all these incredible artists went. If you haven't seen Joan Brown's exhibition, get there in the four days it's still open at SF MoMA. Um, but it kind of becomes this why did CCA go to San Francisco? Because that's where things are happening. I'm not defending it, but it's just this area, there's the whole ferment of newness. And you asked about preservation. This is so different from you when you were working on the downtown plan. The San Francisco Planning Department, you know, it has its Historic Preservation Commission, it has its landmarks. The focus is geographic diversity and cultural diversity. So architecture kind of comes in down the list. And I'm not saying that's bad, but it's the, the focus is kind of we need, you know, if you go through, there's a list of landmarks, and I've been meaning to do this story for a year, but I don't know. You go to the historic preservation, the planning department's list of San Francisco landmarks. It's past 300 now. It's even cross Berkeley's line, I think. <laughs> um, and you go down in like the last 25 or 50, are very much driven toward, we don't just want the downtown things, the individual master things, the cool Victorian things. It's very much, we want, you know, like um, the Excelsior, the Royal Baking Company, which is this cool bakery from the thirties. It's a city landmark. And I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying that's kind of the priority. So the, we need to defend the great works of mid-century inventive brutalism is kind of a find some rich donors to do that. That's their problem. Should we, should we get a question? Well, I just want to say though, one thing, sorry, sorry, moderator, because this is an AIA uh, community. And so these are not preservations per se, but they are architects. So, and I think that, that this is where architects uh, have to use their lateral thinking instead of relying on what is listed as landmark, in fact, of uh, doing some kind of a design diagnostic. So uh, is this building, does this building have merits uh, for it, the way of handling specific portions of, of its siting, of its technology, of mm -hmm. its, uh, because the, the fact that it's landmark, uh, it's it's uh, a bureaucratic aspect. I mean, the, the Brubeck House is not landmark. Does it mean that uh, we can just uh, demolish and have a? I'm not saying that. No, 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 no. The, that's kind of the wind. Exactly. So, so at this point, 
the widening on one side of what constitutes a landmark, and the other is uh, creating a business case uh, for the value of retaining that particular portion of the heritage for the new chapter of that life. And in fact, I do believe uh, in this way, I'm very much uh, close to an art that we don't really hear uh, uh, a lot about Aldo Rossi that saw that the uh, that there is the container and the activities internally to it just keep changing, keep changing. So yes, yeah. we do have the, the the art institute, but it can become something well, else. What, what, what's working? What, what I've noticed what works is when you have buildings that are relatively like factory building, warehouse building. They they can convert it fairly easily to residential. That happens a lot. Yeah. But when you have buildings that are very highly articulated, like those two. But, but but again, it's architects. Uh, that. That, that tends to be uh, that, that I do believe architects have a remarkable resources in thinking laterally about these issues. Uh, uh, because if you look passionately at building, you just do everything you can to save the building. I was at the presentation of, of the of the breaking grounds of uh, of uh, the Trans America Pyramid. Norman Foster talked about landscaping. He didn't talk about the landmark. I said, we need to reintegrate this building into the texture of the city. And we were going to work on the ground plan. That was one of the most brilliant things from someone who was not an landscape architect. So I feel that all these buildings that we have, some of them with commitment to a technology that is difficult, like think about the Neumann Center, if it became a shopping mall, that would be complicated for parking. So, but, you know, you never know. Or, or churches or, or buildings that were so committed to their function that it's, it's hard to make them become something else. But again, that displacement could be an opportunity for other design and, and therefore articulate a, a new chapter for each. So I find that the architects have some agency in this. We're not at the mercy of the development process, but articulating that conversation can help greatly in, in us having, I mean, tragedies happen all the time that the Gardner House by Marshall Broyer was pulled those in a night, uh, overnight. And I have a picture of a house by, by, by Philip Johnson in Long Island, it was one of the greatest uh, houses of the Mission period that has been, I mean, butchered beyond belief. So you, you lose the property value by doing that. So if you can make a business case like that, down in Palm Springs, I don't think that San Francisco is a bigger Carmel. I think that there are bigger opportunities than that. Oh, um, I was curious, there is a couple of things that are tying in together. Um, you know, you were talking about Cincinnati that went back and you saw a dying city. And I think in San Francisco and in some of our downtowns, you know, there was this huge influx of cash, this huge development of the downtown. But now it's working remotely and the pandemic and these downtowns, they're just, they're ghost towns. And, you know, there's the question of, okay, how do we add more housing? How do we turn these glass facades into something that people can use? And I think, you know, our relationship with these beautiful buildings, you know, people just aren't really going down there right now. And, I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, how you see um, the downtowns and of the Bay Area and. The well, San, you know, San Francisco is considered the worst in the country. Mm -hmm. It has the biggest fall off of office activity of any city, and it's ongoing. And uh, it's it's really a it's a it's a crisis, and it and it parallels the retail crisis. So we have two phenomena there, right? One, people are shopping online more and more every year, and there are fewer, you know, stores, and and then and then we have an office crisis now that people are working at home remotely, and it's gonna it's a tremendous challenge, I think, to the American downtown and to, to, to San Francisco, to Oakland, to any hopes that San Jose will have a vibrant downtown. And I don't think anyone has quite any, doesn't quite know, we're still early into it. I'm, I'm yeah, not it's sure. a huge, we're not huge sure what, what's going to happen, but you're right. It's a tremendous, it's probably the biggest crisis now. Uh, in addition, you know, if you look at the environmental crisis and the social inequality crisis, this is the third, you know, the, the, the vibrancy, because we're all, you know, everyone is pushing toward getting out of our cars, right? 
and living more sustainably. Well, how do you do that if downtowns are going to be bereft? So it, it's I, I agree. It's, it's the but isn't this an operational landscape urbanism? I mean, can these answers uh, be produced within the context of an interdisciplinary design team? Because, because it, I mean, we can reskin a building beautifully. I think that yeah, still happens at the ground level, you know. Yeah, I, think the issue. I think it's a, I think it's a crisis of the magnitude of I compare it to the automobile when the automobile became took over in the 20s. You look at downtowns in America, first of all, downtowns weren't what they were until the 1890s. You know, they became something. They became these commercial entities, right? With movie theaters and department stores, right? And, and all sorts of commercial businesses, but they offer residents and industry less than downtown, right? So the downtown changed a lot, but we have this image, this remembrance of the downtown as this incredible, vibrant commercial entity that when the people finally really took over after the Second World War, they went into crisis across the country. San Francisco much less so than others. Look at Oakland's downtown was in tremendous crisis and it never fully recovered, I would say, from the, you know, from the 60s. And the same with Cincinnati, St. Louis, you just go across the country. So I think this new crisis, this new re, you know, online retail and remote work is something uh, in magnitude similar to the, the, death, the arrival of the, of the automobile and then the freeways. Right. And, it's, and it's, that's taken a long time. That's been a hundred years that we've seen the devastation to, down to, you know, to American cities. Um, this is just started. So I don't, I would just say we don't quite know what's going to happen, but I, we just have to accept that the magnitude is comparable. And it's, and it's just hard to say because, you know, a city like Cincinnati, which is a terrific city in so many ways, I mean, that was these huge, large industrial forces. The weird thing with the pandemic, it's like kind of this quick hollowing out and, you know, Housing, part, you know, most of the city is still in really good shape and things like that. Um, but uh, David Trachtenberg here, he and I were talking earlier today. You know, you look at Berkeley's downtown, which is a lot healthier than a lot of downtowns. It has a lot of, it actually has construction cranes, it has development proposals. That's because it, you know, basically the university, the notion of town and gown has just been kind of is being wiped away. So the downtown Berkeley will probably do pretty well because it's, you know, becomes kind of like a student neighborhood. And so it didn't have much office space to lose. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have the retail. As it's long as power bar is there, whatever's at the top of the metal. Yeah. Well, one more, you have a good one, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> closing one. I was going to comment, and it really goes back to the Cincinnati thing. And is there a difference between not only San Francisco, but in fact, the entire West Coast? Let's say starting off in Vancouver, going all the way down to Tijuana and skipping down to Chile and things like that. On the West Coast, we, we practice architecture, I think, with a lowercase a, whereas in Cincinnati, it's really with a capital A. In other words, it's the role of architecture and the grand buildings and things like that. And does that really impact how we look at when we talk about tearing down buildings that are critical architecture? Because culturally, we haven't embedded the notion of architecture into our popular culture. Yet, under the small case A, we've had those 30 years between the end of the Second World War and into the 60s, where the residential architecture was really phenomenal. I think that residential architecture, the connection between the home, landscaping, and place, was second to none, but that was a lower case. We have a different kind of view, and, and does that impact yeah. how we do things? Just super quick, and this gets back to what you were saying about the Venice idea of San Francisco. Tacitly, the landscape here is so much more important to people. Um, when I was starting out as a reporter, I was living in Boston and worked there, and journalism has changed. The Boston Globe flew me out, I, I pitched this idea like everything that Chicago holds sacred, Boston hates. But everybody will say Chicago's buildings are a lot better. Why is this? And then uh, to cut through all the drama of the story, uh, which I, 
defy you to find it online because it's pre-computer. Um, and talk to a preservationist in Chicago. Is it, you know, in San Francisco or in Boston, you down zone to the water because the whole idea is to keep the water low, keep it open. In Chicago, you up zone. And there it's the talking people is like, well, you know, the shadows are just going to fall in the wall on Lake Michigan. So who cares? And in terms of height limits, which Boston and San Francisco were very similar in the 80s and trying to pull the plug on modernism and pull the plug on anything new and adventurous. It was like, we don't have hills. We don't have a, we don't have a natural topography. Our topography are our towers. You know, so it's just different places have different mindsets. And here it's like, um, you know, my gosh, I'm going to get on my bike and I'm going to go bicycle down the Bay Trail. That's what I'm going to do this weekend. No, not this weekend. Not this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> not for the last bit. But, but you know what I mean? It's just kind of like here, there's a different, the landscape is so different and the casual encounter with the landscape is so different that architecture gets knocked down to a small A, which is also why great buildings can get lost because there's a cadre of people who appreciate them and then a lot of the others are they're they're going out to point Reyes then on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't rain. Two Saturdays from now. Thanks all for joining. It was wonderful. Thanks for you, Chief, for uh, moderating. <laughs> Everyone. So there's a whole bunch more coming up. So on March 21st, urban design and planning. Uh, so please join us here or in the future months after that. Thank you. Thank you.